Ladies and gentlemen, my dear friend Liz Franzak would like to Mm. read a poem that she's written for the occasion. Liz, if you would. According to the PRC's unwritten protocol, to be Chinese these days, it seems you can't be Falun Gong. Your race or where you're born no longer matter much at all. You have to be an atheist in order to belong. Good citizen or not, unless you bow to Xi Jinping, you'll find yourself condemned as one of China's enemies, no longer viewed as human by the party, but a thing, whose life and body parts the government is free to seize. To have faith in God, or something greater than the state, will mark you as a traitor or could lead to your arrest. With prison or labor camp, your destiny and fate, as many who have suffered through such trials, will attest. How strange that only communists can call themselves Chinese. (laughs) That's right. While Uyghurs, excuse me, while Uyghurs, Jews, and Christians are held worthy to condemn, but Chinese on Formosa who declare their Taiwanese are part of what the PRC declares belongs to them. I don't know about the verse here. I'm just going to say right off the bat. I just, mm, it's a little awkward. That's, that's a little tough. How sad that people are condemned for being who they are. So true. Unless they publicly abandon all that they believe or bow and scrape before some petty party commissar. If I were in their place, I'd pack my things and try to leave. I think that's actually pretty good. I'm imagining it in some, in one of those like um like cardboard, uh, you know, children's books uh-huh. where, you know, they, they kind of like fold out and they've got the, you know, a little good night moon, but this is like good night PRC kind of situation. I, I have always said, so I, as you know, I, I hold to very obscure racial theories that I myself spend most of my free time crafting. Sure. And it's crazy to actually see something. It's like almost like a bit of a synchronicity to see one of Rachel Jake's theories in the wild because- Wait, which I one have is that? long said that if you uh, if you adhere to like strongly left wing political beliefs, you are Chinese. Oh. <laughs> and to see that in a poem like this, read by yeah. a woman like you, a Ch- another Chinese person just like me, t- it is it is. I, what is that? It's validating. Mm. How strange that only communists can call themselves Chinese. I like that line. I think me there's too. a good rhythm to it. It's nice. Hello, everyone. Hello, my name is, and we don't have the gong because I'm recording from a prison cell, Brace Belden. My name is Liz, and we're recording from a prison cell because I, oops, gave away all of Brace's organs. Whoops. We are, of course, joined by producer Young Chomsky, and this is No Gong, True and On. True and On. Hello. So Liz is joking about donating my organs because I have no That's organs. right, because I made money off of it. Yes, yes. She sold my organs. <laughs> but the fact of the matter is, is that I am in prison, and you're allowed to podcast from here now, uh, and so is Liz, because obviously many of you know that we are independent media company. Mm. That we are independent media company. <laughs> but did you know that that's illegal now, Liz? It is. You know They're why? Make, why? Brandon's DOJ keeps going after the freedom speaking, freedom loving, freedom not fearing. Uh, I'm still trying to keep going. Fellow CFOs of independent media companies. Now, Liz, I have often winced visibly when you referred to Biden's Department of Justice, the DOJ, as Mm. Biden's Department of Jewish Lawyers. (laughs) The D-O-G-L, as you call it. But you know what? (laughs) It's true. It's true. She won't say it publicly. But you should say here the stuff that she says privately that she knows I'll forgive her for. 
Uh, the Epic Times is under attack, ladies and gentlemen. And Which, here's what they need to do a ruling on, by the way. Is it what? Epic Times or Epoch Times? That's what we, we need someone to come down with. Let us what know. Con- what conclusion did we come to during the Falun Gong series? The thing is, I think it's Epoch Times because that's how Epoch is spelled. But... Through doing that series and you constantly saying Epic Times, I've just now, now I just say Epic Times. And now when I read the word Epoch, I read it Epic and it's like fucking me up. I think they say Epic Times sometimes. I don't think people know yeah, what they Epoch also is. commit crazy fraud. So alleged really to commit to crazy fraud by the Biden's Department of, as Liz calls it, Jews. Lawyers. No, that's not. <laughs> it's just, it's not, I call it the Department of Justice. Liz has her own little nickname for it. Ladies and gentlemen, you might remember our three-part series, 3.5-part series on the Fallon Gong. Oh, my God. I wish we weren't fucking recording remote. Do you know how tempting it is for me right now to just hold an invisible mallet in my hand and smack an invisible gong? But you would you look at me like do I'm a crazy it, person. But Young Chomsky can just put in a, a gong sound, but let's make it a gong sound that's very different from our gong sound. Yeah. Because I do want to say that I saw some people saying that they were like, oh, I always assumed the gong was like not real. The gong it was is just real. a sound. And I'm like, bitch, seriously? You think we didn't the, buy a fucking gong? The gong is, is next to my feet, my bare feet, which stink and are sweaty. Ew, I don't want that in there. But keep it my the the gong the gong stands next to my bare feet every time we record yeah so right time. now young chomsky will you do an artificial gong we did a 3.5 episode series on the fallon gong i say 3.5 because three episodes are about the fallon gong and the 0.5 which is actually a full episode a, despite what the point my five might tell you, uh, is an interview with a former Epic Times, Epoch Times journalist who mm. uh, had some, let's say, illuminating things to say about his time at the company. Which, by the way, if you haven't listened to that series, go listen to it. It's, it's crazy if you haven't. We're putting the links in this in the description so you can just click on over real easy. It's quite a gas. Um, Brace and Young Chomsky famously got... Uh, interviewed by oh yeah Shen Yun promoters well, after we well, went and watched it at Lincoln Center so by New uh, Tang Dynasty Television yeah. well same thing it's all one thing which you'll find out about when you listen to our series okay so plug the over. CFO of Epic Times was indicted this week in the good old Southern District of New York for allegedly laundering sixty seven million dollars of quote illegally obtained unemployment benefits to fund the media company. (laughs) It's a lot more exciting than it sounds, I promise. Um, They were targeted by the Organized Crime Drug Enforcement Task Force, which is what a bunch of different Leo agencies, like what's going on there? Yeah, it's like it's just it's like a bunch of different. It's like FBI, I think DEA, all these guys. It's like a fucking task force. So they got okay. a guy from everything in there. They were actually they were targeted by a bunch of different government agencies, including, of course, the Department of Labor, because yeah. well, they were stealing unemployment benefits, and the Department of I believe it's DSS, Diplomatic Security Services, mm. which has to do with like I, I think that was more like coordinating foreign law enforcement agencies. Uh, like helping out with actually like nailing maybe where this uh, where this was coming from. Legit, um, thought you were going to say the DSA. That's like the DSA. <laughs> yeah. Well, no, it's cooperation a kind of law is good. Everyone is all kind of working together on this one. The CFO, which of course stands for Cash Fun Organizing. <laughs> uh, he uh, Y Dong Guan, aka Bill Guan. Um, he got hit with two counts of bank fraud, one count of conspiracy to commit money laundering. He's the CFO. That's the chief financial officer. He's the guy that seems to be sort of the one that's been in charge of basically making all of its money over the past few years. And something we talked about in our series when we, you know, towards the end, when we kind of were discussing the Epoch Epic Times was how crazy 
their money operations seemed to be post-2020, that they were just kind of raking in all of this money and no one was really clear where it was coming from. Yeah. I mean, if people will remember, if you live in like a, a city that has a city hall, which not most of the country, mm. uh, if you look like near San Francisco City Hall, for example, in 2015, 2016, you would see a couple of Epic Times like newsstands or whatever. Yeah. They were handing out the paper. I, maybe you could buy it. I don't know. But it was a pretty small operation. And then it seemed like during the Trump years, especially like maybe 2017, 2018, then really 2019, 2020, it was mm. everywhere. I yeah. mean, it, it, it became such a big ad sp- or, uh, fucking money ad spender on Facebook that they actually banned it from advertising because it was basically <laughs> like uh, unofficial Trump ads that they were running. But they became one of the most prominent conservative news outlets in the country. I mean, they have like a dozen YouTube channels, very few of which actually disclose affiliation with uh, Epic Times, let alone Falun Gong, uh, just in English alone. But they are worldwide. They have play, They have different, like you know, they have like uh, YouTube channels in, in countries and with languages that you could never even believe, like Vietnamese. But they are <laughs> everywhere, and they became one of the biggest, like kind of QAnon, Michael Flynn, a little kind of crazy out there, right wing media outlets in the country. I think what surprised a lot of people is how big they were be able to. They were able to come that quickly. I mean, they just pause. <laughs> what? <laughs> I don't fucking know. <laughs> what? <are> you- <laughs> how ah. big they were able to get uh, so and how quickly they were quickly. able to do so. Yes. Yeah. But I like the way you said sentence. it too. Sorry. I'm really hot in this room right now. My God. I'm glad it's that like- I finally got to drop a pause that made sense. Young Chomsky, why don't you have the air conditioning on? You don't have to, the mic's not picking up. You don't have to say anything. But why doesn't, you should have the AC on. Liz and I can't. I do. I do. Oh, I'm roasted in here. My AC but is I, off. I That's all you hear. Oh, certainly I do not. So, Guan is not the most searchable guy in the world. His real name, Wai Dong Guan, is, is, basically has no hits on the internet. But Bill Guan, which I assume is his, like a lot of Chinese people pick like an, like an English language name and it's usually something like Bill. Um, the first hit comes up on him from newspapers.com. In a 2001 article from the Ottawa Citizen, Ottawa? Ottawa Citizen, about a Bill Guan from Montreal participating in a vigil outside the Chinese embassy to protest the banning of the Falun Gong. So 2001 is just a couple of years after China officially prescribed the group, and a lot of them moved to the U.S. and became very quickly sort of dissidents du jour. So how exactly were they laundering this money? Well... (laughs) Here's a a very fun quote to start us off from Republican strategist Brendan Steinhauser, who was hired by the Epoch Times to make inroads with Republican politicians. So here's a quote from Brendan Steinhauser, who's a Republican strategist who was hired by the Epoch Times to make inroads with Republican politicians. And it's from a 2023 article on, I believe, NBC by that chick, Brandy Zarzani, who's I don't really know what her deal. I just remember seeing that last name whenever I read one of these fucking articles. <laughs> they take advantage of every opportunity, Steinhauser, who is not currently working for the Epoch Times, continued. They studied digital marketing. Okay. They learned how to work the system, and they did it. They're smarter than people give them credit for, and they've got the money to back it up. Okay, that's a really funny – I feel like I remember us talking about this in – the episode we did, because I remember yeah. us referring to that piece by Brandy Zardzoni, because I also remember that name. I mean, how could you forget it? Sounds Quite like a, a polar city. Uh, <laughs> but uh, it's really, really funny, the kind of positioning of them as, first of all, studying digital marketing. Like, okay, who are you, Alex right. Earl? Like, what are you fucking yeah. talking about? Who's not studying digital marketing? <laughs> You know what I'm saying? Yes. Also, it's really funny in light of what they were actually doing, which was using crypto to buy up stolen identities that were used to like fake unemployment benefits on prepaid cash cards during like the big COVID rush of sending out unemployment checks to everybody. Yeah, it's 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 really funny because I think one of the things that really stands out in a lot of articles that you read prior to a couple of days ago, but the Epic Times, is so many journalists wondering how the fuck they have so much money. So mm. the way that Epic Times has always claimed it made money is just by small donations from people who are appreciative of their coverage 
of Anthony Fauci and the Chinese Communist Party. I mean, the Epic Times is a, I guess, newspaper, but it's almost just like a multimedia company where they have all these various, you know, YouTube channels and like little mini documentaries about Fauci or whatever. And if you really want to like see the exclusive stuff on their website, you got to pay like a premium price. The thing is, the amount of money they were spending just did not match up at all with apparently how much they were actually making. And, uh, and I think this made banks a little suspicious because it turns out they had gone up by, I think, a 410% <laughs> in just a few years. <laughs> Which is crazy for a digital media company. That's not happening. No, I mean, it's, it's, it's 2020 was really the big year for them. So this is from the indictment. That year, the media company, and that's who they're, they're referring it to, to Epic Times as the media company. That year, the media company's internal financial accounting reflected an increased annual revenue over the previous year of approximately 410% from approximately 15 million to approximately 62 million. A significant portion of this increase was attributable to the media company's foreign office, including the MMO team, which was managed by Dong Guan, a.k.a. Bill Guan, the defendant. Now, Brace, MMO team. If you're just coming to this, you're like, oh, that must be the name of like a typical kind of like, oh, that's just shorthand for like some digital marketing term that I don't know about because I didn't go to University of Miami or whatever. Arizona, I see you. Um, what does MMO stand for at the Epic Times? Making money online. Now, I got to tell you, every time <laughs> I read about a company, I always hear some, especially like a media company, there's always some like DEI, HR, one of these fucking, these little things. I'm like, I don't, I don't really understand what this is. Making money online, that I do get. And the way they were making it is just like Liz said. Buying up <laughs> stolen identities, stolen <laughs> unemployment checks, and then cashing them out at 80 cents to the dollar on crypto exchanges, and then laundering that money back through their own bank accounts that they opened up, but they were not actually their own bank accounts. They were other bank accounts that they had opened up with other stolen identities, and then laundering that as donations to the Epic Times. So to be, I mean, to be fair though, like that is a way to make money online. <laughs> Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It really is. Well, I think a lot of people are also confused as to like why the Epic Times would be getting rolled up right now because the Epic Times are mm. obviously controlled by the Falun Gong. And I think a lot of people, quite rightly so, like associate the Falun Gong with some of the seedier parts of the US government, right? CIA, FBI, State Department, whatever. Mm. Um, and I think that actually we probably can get kind of some insight onto why that happened from some things that actually have to do with another part of the Falun Gong's internet operation. All of the laser eye Brandon memes. Yes. Yeah, exactly. They're the ones (laughs) that are behind it. So the Falun Gong has always had a really heavily online component to it. I mean, really since the early 2000s. One of their earliest projects was something called Dynamic Internet Technologies, which is a CIA sounding company if I've ever heard one. This was a nebulous, quote, tech company that seems to be, aside from the organ harvesting propaganda, the most useful thing that they could provide to the U.S. government. Mm. So it was started by an Ohio-based practitioner of Falun Gong named Bill Gia. Started in 2002, just a few years after Falun Gong moved to the U.S., and it offers just three main products on its website, which is still around, although it doesn't seem to have been updated in 17, wait, 19 years. That's cool. Uh, it, yeah, I know, but it, for some reason, it's still completely <laughs> all works, those which is sorts crazy. of websites. By the way, gone, just gone. Mm-hmm. No way to find them. No Dust way to in the wind. Them. They're still paying for this. I mean, maybe some part of it has been updated, but definitely a lot of it has not. Mm-hmm. Uh, Dino Did you sign the little guest book that I'm sure they no. have? <laughs> oh fuck, I forgot about those. <laughs> Never forget about those. So they had DynaWeb, FreeGate, and something called Mass Mailing, which, after looking into it, I believe is. Literally just mass mailing. It's not like a specific product. Mm. Well, similar to make money online. They list four clients on their website, and you'll never guess who they are. Mm. Voice of America. Okay. Radio Free Asia. All right. Human Rights in China, which is a Falun Gong front group. Mm. 
and the Epic Times. Okay. So I was looking at their like product. I mean, I know about uh, DinoWeb and FreakIt. I think we actually covered those in the Falun Gong episodes. But I was like, what is mass mailing? And they seem to be advertising that they just know a lot of Chinese people's email addresses. Yeah. Because they're like, we can get 2.3 million emails in China <laughs> sent out in no time. But like, is to it be really- fair, 2.3 million emails in China is like 100 people in the United States. I was going to say, that's like nothing. There's yeah. like a billion Chinese people. 2.3 yeah. million? But yeah, also back in 2002? No, it was still about that. <laughs> yeah, still, yeah, still not very good. Um, DynaWeb and FreeGate are products that sort of resemble VPNs. They're basically like ways. Remember how we always used to hear about the Great Firewall of China, Liz? Now we're building our own Great Firewall. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, we are. We're keeping the Chinese out. When they used um, to keep us out. How these are like, the table has turned. Internet freedom products to get you around the Chinese firewall. Falun Gong practitioners also started a similar product in Silicon Valley called UltraSurf, which is the mm. same exact kind of thing. Like it's a way that is supposed to allow Chinese people to get around the Chinese firewall so they can look at Falun Gong teachings. Mm. So obviously, DynaWeb got uh, these contracts in the US government. They were sending out Voice of America and Radio Free Asia. In the mass mailing section, for instance, they talk about how how one of their services that they 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 did was this mass mailing and they would send out VOA and RFA articles to people in China's mailboxes. Now, this is where the open technology fund comes in. And this is sort of where I believe Falun Gong's usefulness to, I would say, the main deep state kind of comes to not an end, but maybe it tapers off a little bit. I mean, if you're going to say dynamic internet technologies is the CIAS sounding name, I'm going to go ahead and say open technology fund might beat that. Well, you'd be right on that. So it was a project (laughs) under the uh, Obama-Clinton State Department, uh, specifically under Radio Free Asia. So for those who don't know, Voice of America, Radio Free Asia, Radio Free Free Europe. uh, Sponsors of this podcast, obviously. Obviously. But they're like, uh, they're basically like our propaganda websites like mm-hmm. they they are they're u.s government like run websites that usually or, or excuse excuse me usually always put the u.s government line on things out there but they're basically like propaganda aimed at people in other countries right yeah. like specifically in 42 i think is when voa started it was to counter nazi propaganda but then it was very useful during the cold war radio for europe also i think they're probably less useful now for the US I mean, government. they all still exist. It's funny because they all literally did start as like radio stations, but now they're mm-hmm. all just kind of websites and news outlets in their own right. And they take on, you know, bright eyed, bushy tailed college grads from the US to do reporting for them. But I can't imagine that there's like some guy in China who's like, I hate Xi Jinping. Better see what Radio Free Asia is saying <laughs> because there's so many other just websites you could look at that probably agree with you and also probably have some better articles on But it. also so many people source stories from those places. Yes. So, I mean, everything is kind of a pyramid scheme online. So when you get in at the bottom, your chances of being, you know, relayed yeah. up to the top and other stories kind of maybe go up a bit. I will say also, this is a whole series uh, this is a whole episode of us plugging our old episodes because we talked extensively about Radio Free Europe, Radio Free, I mean so many of these outlets with Yasha Levine many many moons ago, which we yeah, recorded like four in years ago. Young Chomsky's apartment, do you remember? I do. We it saw, was one I of our like on early Chomsky's episodes. Set. Yeah, it was a really early episode. And I'll say it, old timey fam favorite, because Yasha is so fun to talk to and very easy and cool. And you can check it out. I'm gonna we're gonna link to it in the episode notes too. Boom. But basically, open technology fun for those who aren't gonna listen to the episode, which should be zero of you, mm-hmm. uh, is a was a project started under Radio Free Asia that was essentially aimed at like internet freedom. Right. And so it was yeah. like US government funding these ways for people under quote authoritarian regimes. I'm not quoting anybody, but I'm sure I am, uh, to get around internet censorship so they could look at Radio Free Asia. <laughs> uh I mean it was really prominent during like the uh the the Arab Spring and all those kind of things. You know, it was yeah. like one of those the spooky parts of the US government's technology arms. Um, you know, they're the people who funded 
provided funding for Tor, for Signal, et cetera, like all that kind of shit. So it's under the purview of the U.S. Agency for Global Media, which publishes Radio Free Asia, Radio Free Europe, as well as Voice of America. And now Open Technology Fund has moved from being part of Radio Free Asia to being just under the purview of the U.S. AGM. I think now it's technically a nonprofit, but uh, I wouldn't trust Mm. it as far as I could throw it. This is prime feeding ground for the Falun Gong. Mm. The problem is, is that after the libtarded State Department, US AGM, all these motherfuckers of the Hillary Clinton years, Trump comes in there. And he's like, listen, Bannon, remember Steve Bannon? How you could I are forget? My motherfucking guy. You made Breitbart so cool. Milo Yiannopoulos, Israel, you are so fucking cool. Miles Quo, like, I think you're going to, I think you're our man for the job. You figure out how to restructure this. You put your guy in there and you're going to make the fucking sickest propaganda we could ever make. And Steve Bannon, for some reason, hates Chinese people, probably due to his weight. <laughs> because, well, I'm just not going to continue on that line of thought. I, but Steve Bannon does not like Chinese people, mm. although he looks like he's eating a couple of them. He puts in a Claremont Institute guy, which are other other sponsors for the show. Right? <laughs> Voice of America and Claremont, the two there. Claremont has had some of the biggest freaks I've ever seen. I mean, physical freaks that they put out there. Yeah. Have you ever seen that guy, Dave Ria Boy? Yeah, he's quite large. No, and I Liz. don't mean no, 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 no. I no, mean no, like no. his 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 thing, like his face and his. Shoulders, I feel like, don't they take up a lot of camera width? Young Chomsky, I want you to, do you know what this guy looks like? Am I, I want you to Google Dave Ria someone? Boy right now. And I want you to tell I feel me like Natty Ria or not. Boy is a hard it's last a tough name one. to That's when you with. take your wife's last name. But this guy is, if this guy is Natty, I will fucking, yeah, he is. Yeah, he no, is, obviously not. No, but Young he's Chomsky very clearly, when you look head. at the proportions. The tracks, that, the belts. Yeah, he's, no, no but the, but the proportions you can tell. Much more of a small man. He has, oh my God, his, this is like the worst version of Young Chomsky. It says in his interest in his Twitter bio, jazz, hi-fi, mm. bodybuilding. Wow, that's you. But he's like 4'10". <laughs> thumbs down. Thumbs I'm not even thumbs. joking. This guy is legit like 4'10", which is a legal dwarf. He's 4'10". I think he's one of the non-anti-Semitic Claremont Institute guys. I think he loves loves Wait. Israel and obviously... You know what I mean by that. Uh, but uh, I think he might be one of the philo-Semitic ones, rather. Um, but he is a fucking freak. That is not the guy that they put in charge of Voice of America. Instead, they put this guy, Michael Pack, in charge. Brace, I have a really quick question that yes. has nothing to do with what we're talking about. This is literally a tangent. I'm sorry, listeners, but I'm just going to pretend like you're not here when I ask this. I was just looking up um, the Rhea Boy uh, mm-hmm. Twitter guy. So then I, and I hit back. And so it went to Twitter home, even though I'm, you know, whatever I got mixed up. And there's mm-hmm. a thing that says NYPD preparing to revoke Donald Trump's license to carry a gun after felony convictions. He gets to carry a gun. That's what I wanted to ask you about. So how does that work that he got a license to carry in New York? So from what I understand, I've been trying to figure out how I can legally Sorry, have a gun here for a while. And I just, yeah. I know it's such a headache that I haven't even started to look. Um, I think if you have a business, you're you have weirdly a business? enough allowed to. I know, but I think it has to maybe be like a brick and mortar one. I'm not sure if Trump Towers qualifies as that or whatever his motherfucking business is here. Um, but if you're like, there's like, obviously also you can pay off the NYPD, like all the, the what's the Hasidic mm. Police Department got in trouble for doing that. Um, but to carry a gun is even harder than actually like being able to legally have a gun here. Right. So I, I I have no idea. I mean, pro- I literally probably just paid somebody. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it was like maybe grandfathered in from a really long time ago. Yeah, it could be that too. Yeah. Mm. Which I, I, I wonder if Trump has one because I feel like we would have seen him shoot it at some point. But I feel he like he has like- guns at Mar-a-Lago, but he's not a gun guy. He's definitely not. No. Don, isn't Don Jr. is though, right? Yeah, but he's like, it's like fake. Yeah. He's obviously. like, he's like gun guy in the sense that he also has like flannel guy for the photo. He, well, he also, I think he big game hunts too. Which I was is, just going to say that. Yeah. Oh my God. Rich, big game hunter of like 
physically deformed, rich malcontent is just, like such a type. It's so but goofy it feels to British. me. Well, like the most dangerous game is obviously sure. man, right? Obviously, like, yeah. and so it's like, okay, you're hunting like a rhinoceros or whatever. Hunt somebody. Hunt a person. I mean, t- Dick Cheney kind of did. I guess he did. Well, yeah, but he didn't finish the job. He was yeah. like a. Well, he, he just failed. smoked him. A, he didn't even smoke him. He just fucking. He like Imagine Donald Trump face. strapped up walking around New York City. You think he's got like a desert eagle? That would be so fucking funny. That'd like people so would. Sick. I mean, that's like terrible. But like, also people would like fucking. Freak they should out. let me have a gun here. It's crazy. People, people are people of crazy thoughts about me. They should let I me. I don't have think one. Donald Trump knows anything about guns, which I think is a good thing. I know, but once you're if you're enough of a baller, you have like your like Praetorian guard around you. Yeah, you yeah, don't yeah. need a gun. That's like yeah. actually like beneath you. To have. But that's why the license to carry is so funny. You want the license, but you don't want to actually carry. Because also, but he's so big. Maybe it's all guns under there. <laughs> That's why he walks all weird. It's like weighted yeah. down in his on, at his hips. He's got him at his hips like Yosemite Sam. The roughest, toughest he-man, stuffest hombre has ever crossed the Rio Grande. Yeah, 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 yeah. I just imagine that he's basically covered in a like, complete gun rack of like bolt-action rifles. And yeah. that's why his body type is so strange. Okay, sorry, so, guys. Michael Pack is brought in by Bannon to run the entire U.S. agency for global media. That's, again, covering like Voice of America, Radio Free Europe, Radio Free Asia, and the Open Technology Fund. So NPR kind of did like a big expose of this, which is also kind of a arm of U.S. I I don't know what they're an arm of, but they are definitely aligned with this kind of shit. The Pack came in there and was just like, like Donald Trump pulling out a motherfucking What's the shittiest rifle? What's that MNP? Pulling that out in the courtyard, courtroom, and just going pop, 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 pop. He mows down the leadership of all these different organizations. He's like libtard there, libtard here, libtard there. Takes everyone out. All the heads of all these cleans house. He fucking cleans house and spends millions on a law firm that basically investigates people he was going to fire anyways. So this was part of, again, Bannon was trying to remake all this shit into like a conservative, like a Breitbart kind of Epic Times media network. Um, when it was already pretty conservative, like to begin with. That's what's so crazy. I, I mean, I got to be real. I'm not really reading voice. I, I Maybe it's just like, oh, we're bringing gender to Afghanistan or whatever. Yeah, I have no the fucking idea. Was. I think yeah. that's kind of like what, what it was. And well, right. the thing is, Bannon hates China. And so he wanted it to be like more vocally anti-China. Yeah. Um, As opposed to just like subtly anti-China, which was like the Obama way. Yeah, yeah, precisely. Yeah. So part of this effort was trying to get the Open Technology Fund to give a bunch of money to UltraSurf. Now, (laughs) again, the Open Technology Fund already funds all these fucking VPNs, tours, signals, all this kind of shit. But he was like, we need to give some money to my Falun Gong buddies little project they're doing to make a VPN. There is a State Department audit that was revealed by a whistleblower from this time that shows UltraSurf was actually using outdated technology by almost a decade. So it was like they hadn't updated their shit in about as long as DynaWeb hadn't updated their website. Whistleblower complaints show that PAC was pushing for more, quote, religious groups being funded by the OTF, which is clearly aimed at Falun Gong. Yeah, that's what they're trying to get. Okay. Uh, And then he puts an Epic Times writer on the board of the U.S. Agency for Global Media. So we can see where this is going. And this is a quote from Robin Destro, the Assistant Secretary of State for Democracy, Human Rights, and Labor under Trump. I don't know what the empirical value of the software is, Destro tells NPR. Was I supportive of the Falun Gong? Was I supportive of Ultra Surf? Yeah, but that wasn't my job. My job was to oversee internet freedom. And if they fit into them, that's great. One of the last things that Michael Pack did before leaving office was an interview with a a YouTube channel called American Thought Leaders. Now, American Thought Leaders basically just interviews like, I think like Pompeo, like Republican guys like that. Other Instagram girls, et cetera. Uh, Alex Earl. We should know another one. Who's another one? There's so many. Oh, my God. I know, but she's, what's another one? She's kind of lost a little shine. 
I feel like she kind of has. I don't. You think that she's lost did you enough? See the, did you see the Sports Illustrated? No, I didn't. Oh, okay. Is it bad? Is it bad? I Liz? mean, I'm going to like, well, I'm going to hold off because I don't feel, I'm not going to bad mouth another lady. Do you think that her shine has worn off enough for her to maybe look at starting a new chapter of her life with perhaps a co-author? Like myself? With do you think that she would enter in a kind of lesbian relationship with you? <laughs> Ew, no. Ew, Liz with like a she's she, and is she tall? In my head, she's six feet tall. Which uh, actually is pretty short. No, I don't think she is six feet tall. Mm, I wouldn't like that. So American Thought Leaders is actually an Epic Times YouTube channel, one of many that they have that I'm not sure if American Thought Leaders has visibly has an affiliation, but they all kind of have the same sort of like Weird, blank-faced white guy who brings up the Falun Gong in whatever context that he can. Liz, I, I'm sure you remember when we went and saw Shen Yun. Do you mm. remember the uh, funky white boy who was introducing the whole thing? Yes. The weird, like, Colin Jost guy? He, uh, yes, Colin Jost He was like Aryan Colin Jost, which is so, saying a lot considering Colin Jost. Interesting you say that, the Aryan part, because while he was blonde and square-jawed, I believe, unless it's somebody different, which it could be, but I believe he is an Ohio-born Israeli American. Interesting. Exactly. He had a very weird affected voice, which you'll hear all about if you listen to the episode where we review Shen Yan. Let's be real. He did a full Chinese accent, but he did a Chinese accent of somebody who moved here from China at like the age of six and then grows yes. up mostly speaking in American. Or not, maybe it's maybe 12. Uh, it was strange. It was like It was ESL very accent. robotic. Yeah, but he was an ESL. No, it was very weird. It so, was like a it was like a total like body snatcher. He yeah, was a body was, snatcher. Yeah, it was very uh, unsettling. So the OTF ended up awarding UltraSurf close to two million dollars, but I believe and I was actually talking to Robert Scavarla about this uh, because we were sort of banning about what some of the stuff might mean. Probably due to backstabbing from disgruntled State Department types and like deep state bureaucrats, they actually only got paid a quarter of a million dollars. So they were kind of like they were promised two million and then they didn't actually pay him the whole amount of money. That could actually just be a Bannon thing too, because he seems to be pretty content to be yeah. that shit. So, of course, Bannon is actually really close to the Falun Gong. He put out a movie called Claws of the Red Dragon on New Tang Dynasty Television, which I myself and Young Chomsky have been on. And the problem is with this whole remaking of, uh, you know, USAGM, VOA, all this kind of stuff, is that the fact is Bannon is a fucking psycho. Michael yeah. Pack and all the Claremont people are fucking psychos. Like, if you do want to get your anti-China shit done, which the gov U.S. government very much does, it's like the, there's such a thing as overdoing it a bit. And yeah. they're just frankly not very good at running their own businesses. And so he basically blew the entire operation. I think at the end of his tenure there, Pack was facing a criminal investigation for shit he had done. But the problem is the Epic Times – over the years has grown further and further right and further and further against the U.S. liberal regime, which we now have under Joe Biden. And so my thinking on this is, is that like the, the, the parts of the Falun Gong that were useful to the CIA, useful to the State Department, are, are less and less useful now, right? Because nobody gives a fuck about the fucking Falun Gong persecution in China anymore. No, it's just like nobody gives a fuck about the Tibetans anymore. It's all about the Uyghurs. Even the Uyghurs have fallen off. Come on, no one cares the about the Uyghurs. Hella fell off. Uyghurs totally the fell off. N none of this shit works when, like, half of one of the largest, like, economic power centers of the U.S., aka Silicon Valley, half of those guys go to work in China four months out of the year. Like, none of this yeah. shit works. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I think really it's just like the Falun Gong are just too insane criminal and right wing, which has rarely in the past been a problem for the U.S. government. But I just think that that now outweighs the usefulness, right? The organ harvesting thing is another example. That is still being trotted out. Persecution of the Falun Gong is still being talked about occasionally by State Department, but it really is just like it pales in comparison to a lot of the other stuff. 
And I think the, uh, the massive money laundering operation that they were running probably outweighed the usefulness that they would have. Although, again, I'm sure the State Department CIA is keeping some of this stuff in the back pocket. But it looks like now they kind of burn their own guys here. I mean, I think you're right. I mean, just you, also just thinking about the organ harvesting thing, it's like, it's not 1998. It's not 2002. It's not even 2007, as much as some people might dress like it is. It mm-hmm. is, you know, like, it's not as if even people that are not worldly and cultured are now because of the internet and social media. Hello, welcome to the future. And the idea that like the chi- the Chinese backward man harvesting the organs of the poor, the poor like quasi weird, maybe Christians, we're not sure. Like that doesn't really fly anymore. It's not as believable when there's so much, when you can see like how modern, how Western, how, uh, you know, I don't know normal the same like chinese cities are and chinese people like the that veil is totally gone you know yeah. what i'm saying and even with the government i don't think i don't know i mean i think that there's a lot of standard ccp like propaganda that definitely works and clearly we see it all the time here but this other this like kind of crazier shit just seems almost too it's like too extra now. It's like chill out, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I agree. I, th- I think that like the, the propaganda that these guys put out is really, I mean, we saw it in Shenyun. You know, if you, if you went into Shenyun, like having a neutral opinion of China, I don't think you could come out of that thing being like, you know, that there's just like a nation of human vivisectionists over there, that all yes. they do is just beat on these poor religious people who just want you to stop texting so much. Which is also why, like, the richest men in the world are always doing business with them. I mean, it's absurd. So there's, like, another callback portion of this show, which this is... (laughs) I hate that so much. We're talking money, baby. Do it again. Cha-ching. It also sort of sounds vaguely racial, which I like. Whoa. Yeah, I'm just well, saying. I don't know if we should put that next to the Falun Gong segment. It's um, the sound of a money. Oh, because you think of Jewish people. Oh, my God. Here we go. I None of this I'm excited to talk about. Mm. I really don't like that this is happening, but it is happening. And so I'm going to talk about it, which is that... Um, Another another man of 2020 fame kind of returned to the scene this week. This seems to be like an ongoing theme. Dr. Um, Anthony Fauci is that back is- <laughs> with a new virus that you people are going to love. You know, he is there. He was doing. Did you look at any of the testimony? Oh, he, he was talking. He oh, should yeah. just go. He should kill himself. <laughs> Don't put that in. Put that in. I'm not saying I don't think he should, but he should. What does that mean? I just I'm saying that I I What's would the say difference in those statements Can you because break it out? I would never say to somebody you should do this, uh-huh. despite the times that I've said that you should do this on this show. But if I was him, I would do that. Does you do you feel me? All right. No, we're not talking Fauci. Um, we're talking. Oh God, I hate this. Deep fucking value, Reddit user Deep Fucking Value, aka Roaring Kitty, another thing I don't like saying, aka Keith Gill, mm. who is the GameStop guy, famous to 2020. Also, they made a movie about him, yeah. which I saw. I didn't see the movie, but I you saw, saw the, the movie. No, 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 no. I saw a clip for it on the plane. And I was like, definitely not watching that. That's crazy. They made a movie about it. And also crazy they made a movie about it because the story is not over. He's back. Okay. Back in early May, he basically returned. And I'm going to say he in quotes. And I'll explain why in a little bit. Hmm. He returned after a long hiatus to Twitter, posting a bunch of memes specifically, do you, you know, the one with the guy leaning forward in the chair that's sort of like, um, no, I'm, no, I'm looking, you know, he's no, leaning like forward. He's playing video games. It's like video games. And then he ooh, leans forward. You know that meme? 
is it is it a black guy? No, it's just like an outline of a guy. Oh, like the guy who's like, they will never do this, and then he spits out a cereal? No, it's just a guy leaning forward in the chair. Yeah, not coming to mind here. Is it, are you talking about, is it the guy with the straining vein in his head? No, it's when, no. You're, it's when you're playing a game and you get to like the hard part and you got to lean forward. He's got a controller in his hands. It's a cartoon guy. He's describing it very well. Yeah, yeah. Not, it's right uh, here. I'm putting it in the group chat. It's that guy. Okay. I've never seen that before in my motherfucking life. Okay. Well, that's the meme. And it's the guy leaning forward in the chair meme. And he posted it. And then immediately GameStop pumped like 230%, bringing up all the other meme stocks at the same time, which is just like, <sighs> I'm so sick of this shit. It is. Yeah. Anyway, since then, it has been kind of a wild ride. Okay. Now, a couple of days ago, he finally did more than post weird memes. He went to Reddit. And again, mm. I'm going to put a he in quotes here. He posted to Reddit. It said GME YOLO update because that used to be kind of what he, that's what he would always post when he was posting his positions in GameStop for the years that he was buying all this stock and these options back in the day during the original 2020 GameStop crazy Wall Street Vets time. Which, by the way, I'll say, we've got a couple episodes about it. We'll link to it in the show notes mm-hmm. if you haven't heard. Because I made, all of these, I made some everything money. we're doing here is, is updates from our previous episodes. Look at that. I all made some money on that. Good for you, Brace. That makes me happy. But also makes me wag my finger because you got to be careful with that stuff. Well, and I, I just think I, immediately all into Bitcoin. Yeah, there you go. Uh, Okay, so a couple days ago, literally like three days ago, he posted to to Reddit, GME YOLO update, a screenshot with his stake in GameStop. What it showed will blow your mind. It said that he had $5 million worth of shares in GameStop Mm -hmm. with an average cost that he bought him at about $21.27. Now, why I say this will blow your mind, that's a really, really large position. It would make basically make Keith one of the company's biggest investors. And the big thing is it's about six times more than the amount that he held the last time he posted his position in 2021. Okay. Which means he's been buying up this huge, large position in GameStop. Okay. I promise this it, is going somewhere. It's been, pr- it's been pretty low. Like it, it fucking went way back down too. So it's been, yeah. It I mean, there's cheap. been like various attempts at kind of like pumping the thing, everyone going like, Oh, we're doing it again. And then it like goes back down and then we'll be like, Oh, we're doing it again. You know, kind of like with the, with the, uh, AMC apes for the past couple years, oh, fuck, they've AMC. all been trying to do it again and trying to like kind of make shit happen through Reddit and Twitter X, the everything app and discord obviously all the crazy haunts of all of these people and Mm -hmm. it's just fucking annoying and i'm sick of it i'm sorry i'm like so sick of it um in addition to that five million dollar equity position he showed that he had bought one hundred twenty thousand call options all like basically in total worth about 65 million dollars all set to expire june 21st now those contracts had a strike price of $20 a share. If he were to exercise those options, it would cost him $240 million to do so, which is a significant amount of money. And I I just like much more than like all of this in total is much, much more than anything he showed having from the GameStop rush at the, in 2020. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. So he posts that shit on Reddit and Twitter, right? And immediately, like, GameStop went all the way up to $40.50 a share, which pushed his calls up towards $21. He had bought them for about, like, on average, maybe, like, $5. Mm -hmm. So it would give him, like, an unrealized game of, of about $281 million. Okay? So let me just sum it up what happened. He loaded up on all of these weekly options before causing the underlying price to triple through his posting. Does that make sense? Gotcha. Yeah. So basically, like he pumped, he just like his own posting pumped the stock like trip, 
triple I mean, what it was. Yeah, you can make that argument. I mean, it's like really similar to a lot of the shit that we used to talk about with Elon, right? Yeah, yeah. And the way he would run stuff or the way that a lot of like people that run pump and dump kind of stuff all over Discord but with smaller things. But this is like a massive amount of money, right? Yeah, yeah. Significant, significant amount of money. He posted like the most recent post, I mean, it's I don't know if he's posted again actually since, but he posted a reverse Uno card, which I just am pointing out because I think it's like so fucking annoying. There are like all of these people devoted to deciphering all of his different memes and like breaking it down. And it's like, oh, we're building this lore and these are the secret messages he's sending about what these prices are going to be and how the stock is going to move. And blah, 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 blah. And I find this like so fucking annoying. I want it all to stop. I hate it. I hate it. I hate it. I, I really fucking hate it. I hate it. This should not be happening. This shouldn't You're be jealous. happening. You're jealous. I'm not fucking jealous. This is stupid. Some fucking Reddit guy posting a reverse Uno card and it makes the stock market like jump a billion dollars. No, stop. Just stop. Like, all the other stuff that makes the stock market jump are like rumors about computer chips and stuff like that, right? Well, I'm going to talk about this. The thing that I want to point out, and this is Matt Levine pointed this out, and this is important, and this is why I'm using the quotation marks here, is that Roaring Kitty which is his name on YouTube. I know. <sighs> That's tough. I know. <laughs> I know. I really don't like it either. Because it's just too similar to what people call me, which is screaming pussy. <laughs> I hate that. <laughs> <laughs> so he has not returned to YouTube. Okay. He's posted an image of what might be. I mean, it would. he's posted an image of a position. Of an mm -hmm. E-Trade account. He ha or his account has posted. His account has posted memes, movie clips, guy leaning forward, Uno card, whatever, on Twitter, X, the everything app. But he has not returned to YouTube. As far as I know, no proof of life yet. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, Matt Levine speculates that perchance someone else is running the account. Because he would need so much fucking money to back all of that up that, like, there's no way someone has to be funding all of this purchasing, right? Well, didn't he? He probably got a bunch of money from that movie, right? I mean, I don't think not. Not that I'm aware of. But like, you would need like millions and millions and millions for this. Yeah, you need like 150 million dollars. Okay, so he definitely didn't get that much in the movie. This he is got, what like, $1 million dollars. This is what Matt Levine said. Do you want to read this? It's in his quotes right here. And I think he puts yeah, it really well. I'll do it in my Matt Levine voice. <clears throat> if you had a lot of money and a taste for danger, how would Keith? Ge how much would Keith Gill's ex account be worth to you? How much would his Reddit account be worth to you? How much would his YouTube account be worth to you? Do you look and sound like him? If you had the ex and Reddit accounts, would these constitute a magic lamp in your hands? Would you most? How would you most efficiently monetize it? If you were Gil, how would you most efficiently monetize your accounts? Is the answer sell them? Wait, sorry, I'm from Lesotho. Sell them to a whale. I love how many. First of all, I love that Matt Levine is both Scottish, Australian, British. What else? Mm. Matt Levine, in my mind here, Matt Levine is from the deep interior of Australia. Okay. And he moved to South Africa mm -hmm. in order to get in on the post-apartheid economy, but was run out for reasons that other reporters are trying to uncover. I love that. You know, he's now a podcaster, which makes him our colleague. Is, who is, is Matt Levine the guy that everyone hates? No. I don't Matt, think Who so. does Matt Levine work for? Bloomberg. Okay, I'm thinking of a different guy. Who's the guy that everyone's always mad at on the internet? He's like talking I mean, about stocks and TV. You know what I'm talking about. He's oh, bald. Kramer? Kramer. Oh, yeah. yeah. No, this is not Kramer. If Kramer yeah. said this, I'd be like, okay, we believe whatever the opposite is. Gotcha. Yeah. If you, yeah as, do whatever the opposite of, of what Jim Kramer says and you'll make money, mm. the, which is not financial advice. Um Okay, so the thing that Levine is talking about there with the magic lamp, I just want to tease out for a second. He's basically talking about if you had the power to move the price of a stock a really large amount, what would you do yeah. with it? And this is like what we talked I about with move Elon. move it upwards. Well, yeah. <laughs> unless you were shorting it and then you kind of move it downwards. Then it would move it downwards, yeah. Yeah. 
Um, but remember the funding secured tweet? Yes. Remember all of that? So that ended up being a little too much. That got him in trouble with the SEC, but then he actually didn't get in trouble, but then he kind of got in trouble, but like definitely not enough. I will say that it seemed like there was going to be a crackdown on all of this kind of social media behavior from the SEC, right? Remember those guys we talked about? I know we did an episode about this. And I will find it and we'll put it in the show notes. <laughs> but it was about those Atlas trading guys. Do you remember? Yeah, they yeah, call them Furus. Um I don't remember that. Furus? Yeah, Furus. What's that mean? It's like For financial us? financial guru. Oh. Isn't that just a guru? Yeah, but they go by Furus. But I think it's kind of like derisive. Oh, gotcha. I like that. Yeah. So, but that was like the Mr. Zach Morris guy and yeah. whatever. And they were the ones running all those pump and dump schemes during COVID. And they would post like photos of their Lambo and, and mm-hmm. they were just like doing penny stock bullshit. Like, do you yeah, remember yeah, that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, there was the, the, the SEC filed charges against them and then bah, 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 the charges got dropped. Um, all those guys yeah. walked away free. And... The reason for that is a little quirk in securities fraud law, which I'm sorry, I'm going to break down. Oh, God. Did you see the photo of their lawyer, by the way, that I included here? I did. There's nothing wrong with that. Oh, because he's not Jewish. That's why you don't like him. No, can you you describe him? He's Sephardic. (laughs) Uh, In a. Does he look like he has a podcast? Yeah, for sure. I'm trying to figure out, and I mean, no disrespect by anybody. You didn't put his name here. I'm trying no. to figure out what race this brother perhaps is, but maybe not. Maybe Hermano, but maybe another of so far unknown one. Perhaps a member of some uncontacted tribe. Uh, he is wearing a vest, obviously. <laughs> uh, he is wearing a the very thickest- starched stiff collar <laughs> and a tie that is i gotta tell you that, that is a tie that nobody is complaining about the girth of which is actually <laughs> come up a lot for me lately uh and he's got a i'm just gonna call that a haircut and he's he's looking pissed off at the fucking camera yeah he looks pissed off at the law but he looks young is- as fuck he looks like yeah. he's like a 31 years old, maybe. Which yeah, he's got fun. a little like Doogie Howser vibe to him. Yeah, yeah. But and in the sense that he also looks like he's like wearing a like much older adult suit, but it shrunk mm-hmm. in the wash, <laughs> so it's too tight for him too. It's both an older person's and too small. Okay, the reason that these guys got off, and I promise we're going to bring this back to GameStop because I think the I, this is the reason why Keith is back to pumping GameStop is Mm -hmm. because securities law is very weird. What is and isn't securities fraud is basically built off of a, let's say, a a lovely stew of case law, judgments, precedents, common sense, common law, all kind of like built off of like one single provision in the Security Exchange Act from 1934. So it's basically just all built off of case law and interpretation. There's no single, like, this is what fraud is and this you can't do, okay? So what feels like what should be simple really isn't. And it's basically because of the magic of markets. Now, Mm -hmm. like, Brace, you've seen Wolf of Wall Street, right? We've talked about this. That's the classic. I feel bad. This is the second week I'm talking about pump and dumps. I'm sorry. And I also don't like really saying that. I don't. Yeah, you say it so often, Liz. I really don't. But then it's like every time I pump and dump. No, no, no. Because, (laughs) ew, first of all, I do not say it like that. You fucking giggle. You say, okay. Okay. I don't say it like that. But then it's true that every time I say it, I'm like, ugh, I hate saying this. Okay. Yeah. Jordan Belfort, you know, famous. He sold penny stocks on the phone directly to customers. He was the broker, right? Mm -hmm. You remember? He worked for that firm, which was basically what you call a boiler room. Also, there was a movie called Boiler Room that was also about this, where, you know, the firm buys up the shares and then they get the brokers to go sell them and run the pump and dump schemes, right? To the guys. Okay. So the thing that was fraud, I mean, there was a ton of stuff that was fraud with Belfort that doesn't have to do with this. So 
ignore that for a second. But what was fraud in this instance was that he was running the trades, right? If a client wanted to buy, he had to go find the buyer, which was him. So that was easy. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, and if they wanted to sell, he would have to find a seller, but there were none. So whoops, that's how you lost all your money. Um, and so, you know, he did all the other stuff that's right, but I'm just talking about this one thing. Now, in the modern world, we don't really buy and sell stocks that way, right? Anymore. I mean, you can, but, you know, most retail doesn't. You yeah. just get on the app, right? He's and Robin someone e-trade or whatever one of those platforms yeah someone buys the stock on an app because you know something you saw some guy tweet on axie everything app but then the stock went down and it turns out like maybe that guy lied but he's the one who made money on it like that Mm -hmm. should be clearly securities fraud right Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. well a big part of legal opinion on this comes from an 80s scotus case Basically, this had to do with you had to prove whether or not like you as an individual relied on information that one specific individual gave in order to make a decision about whether or not to buy or sell something, right? Mm -hmm. And in this SCOTUS case, it was a class action suit. And they said, okay, there's way too many people involved, right? You can't prove, it's too much of a burden to prove each individual had to rely on another individual for information. So we're just going to say that everyone should assume the market itself is a source of information when giving, when, 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 about any given security and what it's worth, right? Okay, yeah. Right. And I'm just going to quote because we can break this down. It says the market is acting as the unpaid agent of the investor, informing him that given all the information available to it, the value of the stock is worth the market price. Right. What does that mean? It means that if people believe you when you lie about what something is worth and then you make money off of that and they lose, it's fraud because the the price reflects all available information, which includes potentially your lies. (laughs) Right, but what I I don't understand, Liz, is it, it's illegal to lie to somebody if you make money off of it, and you, but, yeah. But isn't that my First Amendment to do that? Not when it so comes is, to buying, and not when it comes to buying and selling stocks. I don't put a gun to their head and make them do that. Well, you might find a friend in a very strange judge in Texas because that's basically what they ruled when we're talking about the Atlas trading Furu crew (laughs) from Discord. Uh we I swear we talked about this. I think it was in a winners and losers episode, and we were like, these guys are such losers. Look at them. Well, eh. we were added to the list of true and on wrongs because they were total winners. (laughs) No. Well, you know what? It's it's my thing is this. If you get away with it, are you really guilty? So these guys that I'm talking about, this is Mr. Zach Morris, Mystic Mac, the Stock Sniper, and the podcast that they all hosted called Pennies Going in Raw. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Say it Just, again. It was a Discord group, Atlas Trading, and a group of guys that basically ran the same kind of Wolf of Wall Street pumps from 2020 to 2022. They scammed, or not, according to this judge, close to $115 million dollars but I guess they didn't because the case got dismissed. Now, that Texas judge, he basically dismissed the case by saying that it wasn't actually securities fraud because they didn't sell the securities to all the people who got defrauded directly, which is the thing that you're saying about the gun, right? Yeah. That basically goes against like any like prior precedent or any understanding of what any kind of like fraud could be in a all-encompassing market that where retail can just like enter and buy and sell and you don't mm-hmm. know where the stock is going, right? At any given time. And basically what this what this judge is saying is that fraud requires a direct connection. But then if that opinion holds, it would make basically any pumping and dumping like totally perfectly legal in the in oh, the wow. Trumpian way. And particularly on social media. Which is pretty gotcha. crazy. So yeah. like Wolf of Wall Street would be fraud. Okay, that's fraud. But proxy Wolf of Wall Street too. Penny's going in raw. Mr. Zach Morris, Atlas Furu time wouldn't be. So basically all the people that are like roaring kitty 
mm-hmm. is going to go to prison or pay some fine to the SEC are it's kind of sour grapes because it looks like it's legal to do that as of now. Well, it's confusing. I mean, I don't think this legal opinion, I don't know. I'm not a lawyer. I don't know. I don't fucking know anything, but I would be so surprised if this opinion like held any kind of weight or they, I I think it would be really hard to use this defense. I, I saw Gary Gensler, like just came, was just on CNBC today. I think being like, what Roaring Kitty, what Keith Gill is doing feels like market manipulation. And it's like, Uh I don't know. It feels like textbook market manipulation. Here's a fucking screenshot of my, of my physician. And here's a meme and like everyone floods in. I don't know, dude. Like that seems fucking crazy, you know? And and you, you, you kind of believe maybe the Matt, Matt Levine sort of take that possibly there's somebody backing Roaring Kitty in this. I mean, I don't know, but it seems like it's a lot of fucking money to get. And what's weirder is that he hasn't, like, as of now, he hasn't sold those options. So even uh-huh. when the price, he even when he was up, like, on paper, like, 260 even when he was up $160 million on paper, mm-hmm. which I think he is right now, on those options contracts, like, he's still holding. And he only has to the 21st to sell. So I don't really know, or like exercise with, why would you do that? I don't know. You need a lot of money. The thing that would be, f- that's crazy is that if he does exercise the options, he's going to be a majority stakeholder of GameStop, Uh huh. which, which also he can seems tell them what fucking to do. crazy. I mean, I don't, I don't know what is GameStop anymore. It's should just a meme do- stock. It's not even a company. Liz, should we do a SPAC? No. Okay. Why not? Because... Could we, should People we do don't a, do those anymore. That was what? It was just like a year that they did those? Yeah. They were like the we, ICO of Oh, yeah. The, I forgot about ICO. Should we do – should we uh, – can we – is there any – what's the easiest way we could pump and dump this small independent media company that we have? Wait. I don't want to dump it. No. Well, we pump and dump its value, not the actual company. Oh. It could still work here. Wait. But then if we – Wait, if we still work here, we don't want to dump the value. But we'll be rich from pumping and dumping. But then we'll still be stuck with the company because we'll still be here. Well, then we sell the company to I don't know, Epic Times or something. Well, I don't want to do that. Oh, fine. I'm going to have to figure this out without you. And with that being said, my name is Brace. I'm Liz. We are, of course, joined by producer Young Chomsky. And this has been True Anon. See you next time. Bye-bye. Bye.